Learning Program. And thank you to our sponsors, Alex Partners and IBM. And most of all, thank you for being such an engaged audience. To re-watch any part of this event, you can come back to this website where the recordings will be uploaded. And you can also access all of our videos on Bloomberg Live's page on YouTube. The year ahead continues this afternoon at 12 noon Eastern time and on January 27th and 28th. You can check out our agenda at BloombergLive.com and make a note of the sessions you simply can't miss. We do hope you'll join us again. And thank you for being with us today. COVID-19 brought the world to a standstill. Nearly two million lives lost. The global economy paralyzed. We anticipate the worst economic fallout since the Great Depression. The pandemic is changing the way we live and work. While the virus rages, violent mobs stormed the U.S. Capitol, threatening democracy. Europe, Brexit ushered in a new era. But a new year and an unprecedented global vaccination campaign are offering hope. What will the year ahead look like for our society and economy? Will the travel and hospitality industry recover? Can technology unite us instead of dividing us further? We convene the biggest names across finance, economics, technology, and public health. Hello, and welcome to the year. Join us for what?
COVID-19 brought the world to a standstill. Nearly two million lives lost. The global economy paralyzed. We anticipate the worst economic fallout since the Great Depression. The pandemic is changing the way we live and work. While the virus rages, violent mobs storm the U.S. Capitol, threatening democracy. And in Europe, Brexit ushered in a new era. But a new year and an unprecedented global vaccination campaign are offering hope. What will the year ahead look like for our society and economy? Will the travel and hospitality industry recover? Can technology unite us instead of dividing us further? We convene the biggest names across finance, economics, technology, and public health to create a blueprint for a future that's more resilient, sustainable, and equal. Join us for what's next at the Year Ahead Summit. Welcome to the year ahead. I'm Alekha Kapoor, Deputy Global Editor of Bloomberg Live, and I'm so pleased to be your host for this, the opening session on day one of our summit. Over the next three days, we're going to be bringing together leading CEOs, heads of government, global influencers, scientists, even an Olympian to map out a blueprint for global economies and societies as we all navigate our way out of this pandemic. We have an incredible lineup of speakers, and we're going to begin with an interview with the Prime Minister of Norway. But before we get started, I just have a few quick housekeeping notes to go through with you. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, Alex Partners and IBM. Tech issues, if you have any, and we might. If you experience any issues with audio or video quality, just refresh your browser, or you can use the chat box at the bottom right corner of your screen. Please engage with us on social media. We are active there. And you can use the hashtag, hashtag the year ahead. You can also engage with other attendees in the event chat in the bottom right corner of your screen. All right, let's get started. And please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Solberg. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us at the year ahead. We really appreciate you taking the time. Very nice to be with you. I want to begin by talking to you about the vaccination program. What is the current status of your national vaccination program, and are you happy with the pace of the rollout? Uh, I think we are all uh, eager to get more vaccines because we know that this is the... Uh, uh, the re recipe for opening up our society and bringing uh, more normality back into our our society. But I think what, what we are doing in Norway is that we are following the regulations uh, that is uh, that the vaccines are uh, results are based on, meaning that we are not delaying our, the second dose like some countries are doing. That means that um, we have getting more people who are fully vaccinated, but fewer people who get their first dose. So we do that, this stepwise. There is always a debate whether we should do it this way or that way. But uh, we are happy. I, I believe it's following. Uh, we only hope that there will be no hiccups on the way for getting more vaccines because uh, I think everybody's getting very tired of uh, uh, these unnormal days that we are living in. Oh, absolutely. Everyone is getting quite fed up right now. I want to ask you, how concerned are you about the safety of the Pfizer vaccine for elderly citizens? We know 29 people in Norway died after getting that 29 senior mm -hmm. citizens. Are you still planning on giving this vaccine to the elderly in your country? Yes, we are giving them to the elderly, but we are doing a little bit different in our protocols. First of all, I'd like to say we have been starting out with our elderly care homes. They, these are the most vulnerable, the oldest one, and we have given vaccines uh, also to people who have been quite critically ill and old. And some of them have not been able, you know, they get a small bit of fever that might top them over. and. And we don't believe there's any problem with the safety of the vaccines. 
but we will maybe not give them to the most vulnerable of the elderly because that might uh, speed up a process that where they were what we would say at the end of life phase anyway. So what we see is that that probably is not what we will continue to do. Uh, but we also have a very, very low threshold in Norway for openness on, on the side effects of vaccines and medicine. So we have an open and reporting that also sometimes increases focus on side effects, uh, but our uh, medical authorities are not afraid of that. They say it's safe, secure, and we will not, maybe not give them, give the vaccines to people who are so old that, they, that the side effect might just uh, uh, shorten their life a couple of weeks. You're absolutely right. You have been very open and transparent about what happened with the Pfizer vaccine and, and senior citizens in your country. And there's been a huge interest in the Norway report, perhaps also due to the fact that there has been very little published data, say, in the US and the UK when it comes to the effect of, of these vaccines. Do you think other countries should do more, need to make more of an effort to increase transparency about their vaccination programs to encourage wider acceptance? Well, I believe in openness. I believe that we should be transparent, and I believe that that would be the best to do in the world. But I've also seen the effects our openness have been outside our borders. This is not a big issue in Norway. People understand that this is not dangerous. There's not a big focus on this. I think we know every every week about 400 people are dying in our elderly elderly uh, care centers because they are at that stage of life. So that some of those who get the vaccines die, that's that's just in a way natural. But when you see how uh, exaggerated these news gets in other countries and in other media and how this might um, sort of uh, give uh, uh, the vaccine critics uh, and, and those who are, have anxieties uh, uh, against the vaccination, give them a push and the conspiracy thinking. You know, you sometimes think that um, we have to work on the matureness of also getting the, those open uh, data because if they are misused, it creates fear. And that's why we are trying to work very hard to get the focus that this is not uh, a problem where it's who we have vaccinated, not the vaccine that has created these data. I want to talk to you about COVAX. Norway is a huge supporter of COVAX, and that is the program that aims to distribute the COVID vaccine equitably around the world. When will low- and middle-income countries start getting the vaccine under the COVAX scheme, and which country or which countries will get it first? Well, I can't say which countries will give it first or who, who will, uh, but we hope that the funding and the system now, and especially with the new American administration, who has uh, come back to the World Health Organization, who have said they will fund, uh, and, 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 and the Congress says they will fund the, the COVAX and do their part of the participation, I think we will see that uh, this gives even a bit better focus. The, the distribution is the World Health Organization and, and Gavi and other organizations that will be in, in the lead of. They know which mechanisms to use and, and how to use it. What we really need is, of course, also the type of, of um, vaccines that can be used in countries that don't have the same, you know, uh, cooling systems that, for example, the Pfizer vaccine needs. Because this is a vaccine that really needs a, a quite sophisticated distribution system and, uh, and very, very um, uh, strong, um, you know, cooling systems to make sure that uh, that the vaccine is not uh, ruined. That means that when we are getting vaccines that don't need the same type of, of, of uh, uh, chill down or, or, or freezing level, I think it, it, it will be easier to, to also get the distribution to other countries. But it's a World Health Organization that, uh, uh, and, and, and the mechanisms, of course, is trying to get it as evenly distributed as uh, uh, as um, uh, as uh, the problem, you know, uh, needs. But it needs more funding. We need more funding for it. And I'm very happy that uh, the U.S. now is on board. Given that the U.S. is now on board, when do you think you might be able to, or COVAX might be able to start giving vaccines out? I've read in a few places and heard that the goal was February. Is that still realistic? 
Yes, it's still it's still our aim and goal. We just need to get for vaccines, make sure that the systems for distributions are there, and uh, and so we still hope for February. With this program, there is somewhat of a moral dilemma in certain parts of the world. Now, I know you have said, Norway has said, that you will give vaccines to people in poorer countries while simultaneously vaccinating your own people. But what could you say to some countries who say, no, our priority is to vaccinate our own people first, and we're not going to give up some of our vaccines for people in other countries? Well, I think we have to understand that we are in this together, that uh, uh, the effects on our economy from uh, a large pandemic like this is not just the effects of the internal economy in countries, but the whole global. We are in this together. We have to find solutions. And that's why we believe that we should also give away some of the vaccines. Uh, and, and that's why we're also working with the European Union to find a platform for, for doing that beside the COVAX mechanisms that we are funding. But of course, in the early days, I think all countries will start to vaccinate their most vulnerable because uh, I don't think you will get support. I think I have to be honest, you will not get support in any country if you are giving away vaccines and people and the most vulnerable is not vaccinated. But we hope that we will finish the vaccination of the most vulnerable in Norway by March. By March, okay. I want to switch gears to talk about climate change now, Prime Minister. Uh, mm -hmm. You are committed to cutting emissions and to boosting green growth. You want to be seen as a champion of climate change. Yet Norway is also the largest oil producer in Western Europe. Can you be both? Well, I believe you can be both. Uh, but I think we all have to understand that we are we 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 see that. Uh, the future does not have the large place for fossil fuels, but it will have a place for fossil fuels in the first decades that we see. That means that uh, uh, there will be a need for, for fossil fuels uh, before we are down to the low, uh, low emission country, uh, low emission uh, economy in, in the world. And of course, it's important to understand that the Paris uh, Agreement is based on every country doing something about their emissions. So Norway's responsibility is to cut our emissions from oil and gas production, not to stop French people from driving a fossil fuel car. Uh, so, so we are taking a very clear look at how can we make sure that uh, we stop emissions from the production of CO2, uh, no, production of oil and gas in our country. It's a bit like I could say that any car producer that still, car, that still uses and, and, uh, and a traditional engine that uses fossil, fossil fuel is responsible for that car's emission. I, I think we sometimes have to, to uh, be realistic on this. But we, are, uh, we, we see a future where oil and gas will have less importance in our economy. We are working on our transformation from that into other businesses. And hopefully we will see that we can use some of our resources like natural gas into hydrogen production in the future if we can take care of the, of, of the if we can store the CO2. I want to turn our attention to the elections. You have elections coming up in Norway in September this year. Now, the Labour Party, which uh, used to be neck and neck with the Conservative Party, your party has slipped to third place, while the Centre Party has moved up to second place in the polls. What do you make of this change? Well, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm in office for my now into my eighth year. Uh, and and of course there are some that there will always be a, a discussion on should we change uh, is is the strategies from the government the right ones and there's always a lot of people who say that uh, uh, the government haven't seen my needs uh, I am critical and the centre party has been good at uh, mobilising some of those uh, uh, those views and voices around around the country that maybe feel that the development is going too fast that um, uh, changes are too rapid in our society and that they might want to, to uh, slow sort of the transformation uh, process. And, and um, uh, my job is to try to, to say that we need change to make sure that we take care of what's 
the best sides of our society for the future. If you stand still and others move ahead, you in fact are moving backwards, but this is a Norwegian political debate. Uh, the Labour Party probably have been responsible also in government for a long time, and they have maybe not been able to appeal at the same time to those who, who are feeling that the world is moving too fast these days. Speaking of change and speaking of elections, uh, we all watched the inauguration a few days ago in the U.S., and we have, uh, you know, President Biden in the White House. What are your hopes for how Norway-U.S. relations might change in the next four years? Well, first of all, I would like to say on the most important issue between the U.S. and Norway, the security issues, we've had a good cooperation with the Trump administration, with, with the U.S. It's a long it's a long-standing relations that has not really changed. In some ways, it's been enhanced. But, um, of course, we have also an interest in the international agenda outside our security issues. And, and of course, we hope to see uh, a re-emerging uh, U.S. on international trade, uh, rule of law. Uh, of course, what we are happy to see is that they are going back into the Paris Agreement, that they are uh, entering into World Health Organization issues that Norway is very hard working on and are interested in getting to function. Because smaller countries like Norway, we need um, we need more uh, predictability in our in in the international world. We need the rule of law to be there, not the mightiest uh, in economic or uh, or military power to to rule, and and that's what we hope to see. You know, stability is. Um, of the things we really would enjoy, but both businesses, I think, and, and uh, politicians need, uh, in an insecure world, uh, stability in the international sphere have, will be good. You've talked a lot about protecting the oceans, how important that is to you. And you've talked very often about being on the water, learning to fish as a little girl. You've said now that oceans can help us weather existential threats like climate change, of course, but also COVID-19. How so? Well, uh, first of all, what we, uh, the most under, um, um, the place in the world where we know the least about is the oceans. We don't know what type of uh, medicines we can get out of the oceans. We know that there are large possibilities in the future for 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 the rich uh, rich resources that we have in the oceans. That's why we have to take care of it. That's why it can help on medicines. It can help on on developing uh, new new technology from it. It's uh, it's an in very important aspect. And then of course. Uh, for example, eating fish has a much less climate uh, footprint than eating meat. That means that if we can manage to to harvest our fishery resources sustainably, our the the reports of the the high level panel that I've been uh, been co chairing, uh, the 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 uh, scientific report show that we can increase consumption of fish quite a lot if we are managing our resources better. Uh, and I think this is. Uh, this is important issues in the future because we get healthier. The public health will be better of eating fish compared to eating too much meat. And, and the protein of fish also secures us better against uh, uh, against diseases uh, than, than, than meat does. It's, uh, it's a lot of issues around that. I mean, the story, of course, in Norway, we have this saying that you have to take fish, cod fish, uh, liquid... Um, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure the English word of it, uh, uh, but we, we, we drink that in the winter time in, every month without an R because we have too little sun, so we need the vitamin D, and we know that this really helps on, on public health. So um, we uh, there's a lot more to get from that, and 20% of the uh, of the climate change can be helped by having better ocean policies. Prime Minister, a lot has been said and written about leadership during the pandemic, and that countries that have women leaders, such as your country, have done better in managing the pandemic, or in some cases, like New Zealand, almost uh, you know, almost doing away with the with the virus. What do you think is common between the way you have led your country and the way other women leaders have led their countries through the pandemic? 
Well, I sometimes say that it might not be the fact that we are women as leaders, but the fact that we are elected, even though we are women, might have something in common in our countries. Uh, that I know that in Norway, the fact that Norwegians are having a lot of uh, faith in their political uh, uh, institutions, that they follow when we say uh, we have to work from home, we have to lower the level of activity, uh, people are following up, doing more social distancing. Uh, you don't have to, you know, use, uh, uh, forbid it, use the police force. People are working in solidarity with each other. And um, even though I would like to say that's, of course, because of women leaders, but I would like to say that maybe it's easier to become, as a woman, a leader in that type of societies that mm. uh, are led by uh, example and not by what I would call um, testosterone politics in a way uh, of uh, it's it's uh, it has uh, who you elect also comes out of what type of political environment you have. You know, we've all had to make some serious adjustments to the way we live and work over the last year. Out of these changes we've had to make, is there any one change you would like to hold on to as we come out of the pandemic, hopefully over the next couple of months? Well, even though we are all very tired of looking at each other through a video camera and a lens, I think we should keep some of this. My country has been speedy uh, digitalized by this. We see that we are can work differently. That will mean lead to more efficiency. It leads to more participation by some groups, less participation by others. So we have to make sure that we are not get new differences by it. But of course, it it it, it does and it has been a, a revolution. We never thought we would get every school to be able to teach from. Uh, when the children are at home. But I mean, I closed Norway's, the Norwegian schools, at the 12th of March last year. The first teaching programs were up in the morning at the 13th, and everybody by over the weekend would get a program, meet their teachers. We have a lot of equipment, and we had a lot of... Uh, so we have a distribution of technology in our society, but the use has not been the same. And I think that is something really we have leaped forward into the digital world. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time and good luck as you continue to navigate Norway out of the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to speak to you. Hello there. There is no doubt the pandemic has been an inflection point for the banking world. It supercharged digitalization. What would have taken years took only months. The thing is, customer expectations of banking have also risen significantly. So what's been the impact of COVID-19 on the agenda of banks? What are the key areas for digital bank success? Well, we have the perfect person to address all these issues. Uh, Piyush Gupta of DBS. DBS, by the way, the largest bank in Southeast Asia, a region of 600 million people, Euro Money, named DBS the world's best bank in 2019. Harvard Business Review ranked DBS among the 10 most transformative organizations of the decade. And Piyush himself was named the 100 best performing CEOs in the world, a great believer in digitalization long before it became the buzzword. Piyush, always good to have you with us. Uh, happy to join you, uh, Linda. Now, Piyush, what's fundamentally changed in the way banking is done in the way banking is run and in the way we view the future of banking since COVID-19? Well, Haslinda, I'm, I'm going to actually um, take a quick second to talk about some cyclical impacts of COVID-19, because I do, they have, uh, I do think they have a little bit of bearing. And those cyclical impacts are obviously, uh, there's been a huge amount of demand destruction. Uh, as a consequence, you expect to see large amount of um, non-performing loans and uh, credit costs are going up. Um, equally, as a consequence, uh, monetary policy eased and so interest rates have uh, crashed, collapsed. 
Now, I, why do I think this is germane? Obviously, for banks, uh, you've got to focus on these things uh, in the short term. But I do think that uh, these things will also push the banks to thinking very differently about what their future business models are and what they need to be doing. If a net interest margin and interest income is more challenging, you have to start thinking about uh, very different opportunities and uh, avenues for growth. And if uh, credit continues to be challenging, then you're going to have to think about uh, other ways of underwriting and other forms of uh, you know, managing your portfolio, including uh, digital and data and so on. So just a quick uh, reflection that even the cyclical impacts of COVID have some bearing on where the industry is going. Uh, but uh, more fundamentally, in a secular way, I'd say the three things that have been uh, important on the back of COVID. One, as you alluded to, uh, the take-up of consumption of everything, whether it's healthcare uh, services or education services, uh, has just skyrocketed. Uh, and certainly in our industry, the take-up of uh, financial services electronically, digital consumption, uh, has indeed uh, grown at an exponential pace. Uh, I was just looking at our data. Our total uh, growth in whether it's electronic payments or electronic collections or uh, a whole range of interactivity with the customers went up uh, well over 100% uh, in the course of last year. And what was uh, particularly interesting was this was uh, not age-specific. In the past, we'd expect the younger kids, the younger generation, to take to digital products and tools quickly. Well, the biggest growing, the fastest growing segment we saw last year was the people who are 60 plus. We saw a 4x increase in their take up of digital tools and digital payments. And so the broad based nature of uh, consumption uh, in the consumer space was quite apparent. Uh, what was equally interesting was the rapid change in the corporate behavior. And that includes particularly small and medium enterprises. Many companies who we've been trying to uh, encourage to move to electronic banking and electronic channels over the years, uh, and they've uh, not been that confident and comfortable doing it, they didn't have a choice. When you had to get a letter of credit open or apply for a loan or open the next banking account, uh, banks uh, you know, uh, uh, would only let you do that electronically. So that shift has been rapid. And even in the large corporate space, the number of companies who've gone and reimagined and rethought their own supply chains um, down the spectrum, that's also changed very materially. We're actively involved right now in a range of supply chains and wiring up connectivity, whether it's from the auto industry or the metals and mining industry or just large uh, commodities uh, players. Uh, lots of people have had to seriously invest dollars and thinking on how do you do this thing uh, very, very differently. Now, all of this, of course, means uh, that for banks who are equipped to do that, uh, it has been a bonanza. We've been able to actually uh, get greater customer access and therefore improve uh, market share quite considerably. Uh, but it also means that the banks who had not actually invested in this in the past uh, didn't have a choice. They had a gun to their head. And so it has accelerated the investment of even the slower banks in the space. So in some ways, there's been a bit of a catch up uh, all around. I think some of these impacts and effects are going to be long lasting. So you said inflection point. I think uh, that is indeed uh, true. There is a bit of an inflection point. A second way that has changed, uh, frankly, every industry, but also banks, is our way of working. So if you'd asked me a year ago that we could imagine a situation where 90, 95% of our people worked uh, from home or remotely, uh, I would have said, uh, uh, highly unlikely in our industry. Uh, but guess what? Depending on the country and the situation, we've had anything from 50 to 80, 90% of the people work from home for the better part of a year. Now, this, of course, has profound implications on the nature of our work practices. What do we do going forward? And it's not just simply who comes into office, uh, do you change the nature of the office, do you shrink your footprint, mm. commercial footprint. It is also more important questions about where do you source your people? Where do you locate your people? Uh, you know, people talk about just in case versus just in time. I don't think that's true just for the manufacturing industries. It is equally true now for uh, uh, service industries in our sectors. We're thinking about where to locate our technology resources, where to put our engineering resources. Uh, quite differently. So I think it's going to have some profound implications on how work gets done. And I think the third... Uh, you talked about how... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I don't no, want to... I was going to say that you... Just quickly, very briefly. 
I do think also there's been a turbocharging of the focus on the ESG agenda uh, because I think there's a recognition that tail risks happen and we better be prepared for them. And a large part of this uh, ESG agenda actually also benefits from a digital solution set. And therefore, that's the third thing which I think is going to change quite materially. Uh, you talked about how the non-believers also had to get on the digital bandwagon. Everyone has a digital strategy now. The laggards have played catch up. So what next for competitive edge? Which technology, which digital technology will give you the biggest payoff? Who will lead the pack? And for, for, for a bank like, like DPS, which was ahead of the game, what does it mean? Well, first of all, uh, while, while digitizing, I think, is now table stakes, I think the quality of your digital effort uh, can still make a difference. If you've really thought customer-centric and caught, thought through customer journeys, uh, you will find that there is a lot more you can do. And if your technology stack has already evolved to what I call a modern technology stack, you have a lot more flexibility to do more things. So the fact that we have a 1,000 APIs open for our products to the consumer space that means we can plug into supply chains, we can plug into SMEs, and we can plug into ecosystems far more readily and swiftly than many other competitors can. So I think even in the nature of digitization, you can actually retain a competitive edge. However, I think the real uh, game changers and differentiators over the next five years are going to be a data and artificial intelligence. Uh, your capacity to harness data and use data smartly and intelligently is going to make a big difference. Now, this obviously is not easy. You need to have the technology. You need to change the mindset of the company. You need to build in a whole architecture of responsible use of data to make sure you're not you know, doing the wrong things with data, et cetera. So this is a multi-year journey. And I think a focus on this, which we've been at for the last uh, several years, uh, should allow you to you know, stay ahead of the game. A third area where I think you will see changes is uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology is really beginning to hit tipping point. And while three, four, five years ago, I used to uh, be skeptical about uh, public blockchains because of the need to get exponential uh, adoption. Today, I'm seeing more and more use cases where you can create world blockchains. We're already doing some stuff on the currency space. We're doing some stuff in trade finance. So I think some of these modern technologies will also allow you to move forward. One thing I think you'll see a lot of this year is just the rollout of 5G and uh, the Internet of Things. And if you're um, cutting edge, you will be able to do a lot more things today, even with those kinds of technologies than you could do before. So in short, technology keeps evolving. If you have the nimbleness and the innovative capacity to leverage the new technologies, I think you can continue to hold your own. You know, Piyush, DBS has gone to market with its new digital currency exchange, the first major bank to do that, and that's to meet the rising demand for cryptocurrencies. What's the first mover advantage? What are the first mover risks? Uh, Hazrinda, we're actually trying to uh, do three things with the digital exchange. Uh, the first is to be able to tokenize a whole range of physical assets and actually allow listings, whether the securities token offerings for debt or for equity. I think that's a huge positive because I genuinely believe that uh, you will see a mass scale tokenization of many kinds of assets, not just financial assets, but non-financial assets as well. And therefore, having the capacity to tokenize, but more importantly, to list and then trade is quite helpful. You think about private capital, all the companies sitting on Series A, Series B, and Series C uh, funding, uh, there is no liquidity in these rounds, and so investors are stuck. If we can create a private capability for people to monetize and provide liquidity to some of these uh, asset classes, I think that's a good thing. The second offering that we're offering is uh, effectively to be able to uh, trade a cryptocurrency. Uh, and to be fair, that offering is only for accredited investors. It's on a members-only basis because there are a lot of risks in dealing with cryptocurrency, especially for the uninformed investor. You could argue that a lot of it is not backed by fundamentals. However, for people who are willing to believe that Bitcoin could be the new gold, uh, we want to create a venue and an opportunity to be able to buy and sell that from a respected regulated entity like ourselves. Uh, the third uh, part of our offering is a custody capability. You know, most of the uh, hacking that happened over the years with crypto coins, et cetera, happened in uh, exchanges. Our belief is that if you can actually hold the custody inside of a regulated entity like a bank, 
uh, that would make it very differentiated to other kinds of offerings. Our belief is uh, basically, therefore, there are a lot of first mover advantages. If you go in early, uh, you establish credibility, you do a lot of what it takes to be a bank, anti-money laundering, KYC, controls, protocols, you will bring, uh, uh, build trust, and you should hopefully be able to build the liquidity into the exchange. Now, what are the first mover negatives and something like this? Obviously, nobody knows what they don't know. And so while we've been very, very thoughtful about architecting a solution set that we think meets all of today's pain points, as well as uh, we're making sure that we uh, do the right thing from a control and risk standpoint, uh, there could always be something that we have uh, missed. You know, that is the downside. Uh, as a consequence, we are being quite thoughtful about the pace at which we're scaling this up. Like I said, it's going to be for accredited investors in the first place, and it's going to be by invitation, a members-only exchange. Uh, so we will learn as we go along. Uh, and open it up right. to uh, other kinds of populations only when we're ready. And the thing is, when you take a look at Bitcoin, parabolic surge, massive volatility, I mean, you can understand why governments are pretty much split down the middle when it comes to, to cryptocurrencies, to, to Bitcoin. I mean, Singapore and Hong Kong, they're split on cryptocurrencies. I mean, what do you make of what we can expect in terms of regulation, maybe, I don't know, three, five years down the road? I think that's a broad question. My general view is that sooner or later, uh, you will get to a stage where people are all dealing in digital currency. Now, whether the digital currency is issued by a private third party or issued by a central bank uh, is less important. The fact is that by and large, uh, I think you're getting to the end of cash. You already see that in China. And you, know, you go with physical notes in China, you can't buy a thing. It's all uh, effectively digitized. I don't think you'll get entirely cashless because uh, there are people who still want to use cash for privacy and transactions for inclusion. But broadly speaking, I think you're going there. Now, if you get to a world then where digital currencies are accepted and whether it's a central bank digital currency or otherwise, uh, then you're already getting to the space where most central banks will start embracing and putting around regulation and control to allowing people to hold it and deal with it. Uh, if it's central bank issued, it will be a unit of exchange, a medium of uh, a medium exchange unit of account, as well as store of value. If it is privately issued, depending on how well it's adopted, it might only be a store of value, and that depends on confidence it has. It might not wind up being a medium of exchange or a unit of account. But if you look at the different nature of money, I think digital currencies will start playing a bigger and bigger role. Now, if you look at uh, Singapore. The MES has been very constructive about thinking about uh, digital currencies, uh, distributed ledger technology. We participated in a whole exercise called Project Uber in Singapore to see how we could use the distributed ledger to actually transfer digital currencies onshore. Uh, we are now just leading off an international cross-border project along with another international bank in Tomasek to be able to run digital currencies in the cross-border space. And the central bank has been quite supportive of our doing this. Um, the Central Bank of China is actually quite active in trying to pursue this as well. So I think you will find slowly that many central banks, uh, with controls and with some thought, uh, will actually be supportive of this direction. Uh, Piyush, I want to talk about geopolitics because rising tensions uh, pretty much define 2020. The pandemic has accelerated that somewhat, U.S.-China bifurcation, uh, nothing more apparent than in the tech space. But that tech bifurcation isn't going anywhere, is it, even with a Biden administration? What's your take on that? Well, I think to a large extent you're right. Uh, the concerns around China and the U.S. have been bipartisan on both sides of the aisle. So it's not clear to me that a democratic government uh, would be any lighter on China than a Republican government. In fact, historically, the Democrats have always been more principle-bound. So issues around human rights and uh, IP protection are more central to their agenda. Uh, and therefore, I don't expect any substantive pullback in the nature of the underlying issues and perhaps even the approach of dealing with them. However, where I think you will see a change, and that change is very material, uh, Linda, is in the quality of the dialogue uh, and the tenor of the dialogue. So if the conversations are more civil, if you have more adult conversations, if they follow norms, and if there's a coalition of interests and platforms for negotiation, I think that will lower the heat. And part of the big challenge you've seen in Asia, in fact, around the world the last year, has been uh, the challenge of uncertainty. Uh, the mercurial nature of the toing and froing 
Now, if you take that out of the equation, and there's this clarity and line of sight to where people are trying to go, that actually does a lot for animal spirits and does a lot for creating market confidence. And therefore, while I don't think there'll be substantive change in the underlying, I think there'll be a, a meaningful change in the nature of the engagement and therefore the way the market uh, responds to it. How do you view U.S.-China relations, given that DBS has significant operations in Hong Kong, does business in China? Because in the final days of the Trump administration, we saw how the U.S. restricted the sale of U.S. technology to Huawei and other firms. Uh, investors were forced to pull out of companies linked to China's military. Uh, companies were blacklisted. I mean, how do you put that in perspective as a company doing business in cities and countries uh, with, with a lot of Chinese presence? Well, it's tricky for us, but as you can imagine, it's tricky for all of the nation states in Asia. Uh, if you take Singapore, for example, you know, we like to play squarely between China and the U.S. We rely on the U.S. for a lot of our uh, defense and uh, political uh, connectivity and connections. And China is our biggest uh, market. It's our biggest supply and trading partner. And so there is, a, you know, every need and necessity for us to make sure that we stay neutral and play to both sides. Now, sometimes it's uh, easy to do, sometimes it's a lot more difficult to do. I think a regime in an environment where dialogue is encouraged and you have, like I said, civilized and adult conversations makes it somewhat easier. Some of the you know, uh, uh, steps taken by the U.S. administration in the last uh, several months, uh, if you ask me, have actually been pyrrhic in a way. So you take all of the import tariffs. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the sum total of the import tariffs has still wound up in a situation where China's trade surplus with the U.S. has only grown, it's not reduced. So it's not clear what you've been able to achieve uh, when you did that, as an example. Or you take a policy which prevents Chinese companies from listing in the U.S. Well, at the end of the day, if you want New York to be the thriving capital market, then surely you want more companies to come and access the capital markets as opposed to keep them out. So I think as you go forward, if some of these, uh, what I call PIRIC or, or counterproductive policies are, um, you know, uh, uh, moderated. I think that will be helpful and easier for people and countries who are sitting in the middle of this game to be able to calibrate and, uh, you know, be able to work uh, equally with both sides. Piyush, as we look at the year ahead, what do you view as the biggest risk and what do you view as the biggest hope? Well, I think the uh, epidemiological issues around the uh, pandemic are still uh, out there, uncertain. Um, I think the biggest hope is quite clearly that the vaccines pull us through this very quickly, and so you see steep economic rebounds uh, all over. Uh, but, um, you know, not entirely clear. If you're vaccinated, are you still a carrier? How long do the antibodies last, et cetera? So there is one set of issues around that. Uh, I think a second uh, bigger set of issues, though, is uh, at a societal level. Uh, over the last decade, the issue of inequity, income inequality, the 1% versus 99%, has continued to uh, 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 become more and more important to people. Uh, but the pandemic really brought it to the forefront. The people who uh, were in the top 10, 20% who had financial assets and could benefit from easy monetary policy and rising uh, financial markets have done relatively okay. The people who had to go out of the houses did have to go to work, the blue-collar workers, the, the department store, cash register operator, etc., uh, who are working on a daily wage, uh, were not able to do okay. I think this uh, tension uh, is going to be one of the biggest tensions uh, uh, in the next few years. And particularly this year, as several governments have to uh, willy-nilly wind back some of the support programs, uh, wind back the largest they gave to both individuals, households, and small companies, I think this tension is going to come to head. And therefore, how do we negotiate through this over the next uh, year or two, or fact, perhaps even the decade? I think it's going to be a big source of uh, risk. And finally, the third uh, risk, I talked about it briefly. I think, again, it's been uh, quite clear for the last uh, decade even that the issues around uh, sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability, both climate and biodiversity, are beginning to be very serious. Uh, I think the pandemic has made it quite clear you can't afford to ignore them. Because when something happens, which is a tail event, the consequences are quite catastrophic. 
And therefore, uh, thinking hard about some of these, what do we want to do to get to being a less carbon consumptive society? Uh, what do we do about uh, you know the biodiversity loss that we are seeing? I think that's another big risk that will be quite uh, at the forefront of people's thinking and minds um, over the next uh, uh, several months and years. Lots to mull over. Piyush Gupta, always a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Linda. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Schatzker. I'm an editor at large here in New York City. Welcome to Bloomberg the year ahead. Uh, you'll see somebody else on the screen right now. That's David McCormick. Uh, for those of you who don't know David, I'd like to give you a taste of his extraordinary resume. He's a West Point graduate, a Princeton PhD. He served as an officer in the first Gulf War, and he was an undersecretary in the second George W. Bush administration. Today, of course, he's the CEO of Bridgewater Associates. David, it's great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for joining us. David, here's where I'd like to begin. You're a Republican. You served in government. You even considered taking a job in the Trump administration. I'd like to know, how does the country move forward from what happened at the Capitol building on January 6th from your perspective? Well, it's something I think we've all been thinking about. And, um, you know, you have to start with the recognition that what we saw at the Capitol was just horrific and will be a dark chapter in American history and something that hopefully will wake us all up to the need for being able to bring our disagreements together uh, and find unity and agreement. And I think it just puts, the you know, a, a highlight on the responsibility of leaders uh, to be able to create a dialogue where people are understood, um, people with uh, a variety of frustrations and um, and and concerns and, and anxieties uh, can come together and find a, a common purpose for the country. So I, I hope it'll be one of those things which which brings not not just Republicans but Republicans and Democrats uh, back to the table in terms of thinking, uh, you know, the appropriate direction for the for the country. And I think it's important to remember that coming out of the election. Uh, that the you know the 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 break uh, and the division was very evident in the support that uh, President Trump uh, or former President Trump uh, received in the election. So it's a real challenge and a real opportunity, I think, to bring the country together. I mentioned, David, that you're a Republican. At least you have been. Um, how would you like to see the party move forward? Well, I know it's uh, it sounds trite, but I think this notion of being able to um, you know, use our disagreements as a way to come together and listen and understand one another is really critical. And the thing that um, uh, that Donald Trump did was tap into a reservoir of, uh, you know, I'm a kid from Scranton, outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania. I served in the Army. What he tapped into was a reservoir of, of people, you know, many tens of millions of people who have lost faith in government, have lost faith in the system, uh, feel like the American dream is no longer available to them, um, feel like the opportunity that wants to find America no longer exists. And so we need to appeal uh, to that uh, group of people, again, we as a, as a country, and bring them back uh, into the system. And I think the Republican Party uh, needs to find a way to do that, to recognize the, uh, you know, that, that frustration, uh, but channel it channeled in a way that's productive and constructive, and that's going to require, uh, you know, bipartisanship. It's going to require a common purpose. So I hope the Republican Party will take that energy and channel it in a way that'll be uh, productive, not only for the people that are most affected, but also for the country at large. Does that, in your mind, mean jettisoning Trumpism or embracing it? Well, um, I'd say that it's it's extremely important to recognize that uh, President Trump tapped into um, that level of frustration, anxiety. You cannot uh, wave your hands and that that goes away. That was That's very meaningful. And, and those frustrations and anxieties remain unaddressed. So, so embracing that and the feeling that um, that sector of our country needs to be well understood and brought into the fold is a thing, is a thing I think we have to embrace going forward. I think what we have to not embrace is um, is the divisiveness uh, that's characterized, um, you know, the last four years and the polarization, and uh, I think the president um, has some responsibility, a lot of responsibility for that. And I think that uh, you know this last dark chapter on the Capitol 
will be um, uh, history will look very unfavorably on on that and all that um, all the people that were involved in that. Share with me, David, your thoughts on what you've seen and heard from the Biden administration so far. Well, it's uh, it's it's early days, and um, you know I really appreciated President Biden's tone in terms of um, of his responsibility to serve the whole country, and uh, and 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 bring together that common purpose. And now we'll see how that agenda uh, plays out over time. I think he's picked a number of uh, very capable people for key positions, which uh, which is encouraging. But uh, there's there's a real moment here and a real challenge, and he steps into you know an economic crisis, a health crisis. Um, challenges in America's role in the world. And I hope uh, that he'll use this moment uh, to really do two things, to address some of the underlying problems that existed before the pandemic hit. And by that, I mean uh, uh, opportunity, equality, and and some of the challenges that we face in the country that's really leading to the polarization, um, the challenges with the rise of China and putting together a holistic strategy for addressing uh, that in America's role in the world. And so there's an opportunity to reset uh, and and really address those problems in a very meaningful way. And I hope that the um, that the tone that uh, President Biden has used around bipartisanship will really play out in how he addresses those problems. And that means that you know he's going to have his own challenges within his party, just like uh, Republicans have their challenges within uh, within the Republican Party. And I think it's really critical uh, that he live up to the to the to the tone that he set, and um, I'm hopeful that he will. It's, it's too early to tell how that'll manifest itself. David, you shaped economic policy as an undersecretary, both at the Treasury and the Commerce Department. If you were in government now, what policies would you be advocating most strongly? Well, uh, I think there's the um, there's a set of responses to the crisis which which are well underway, and um, I I won't start with that. I'm happy to address that if if you'd like to turn to that at some point. But I think um, I think the most important thing in my mind is we hear people talk about when when things return to normal, and I hope that the policymakers in both the Congress and the executive branch will use this as a moment to really question that idea of whether getting back to normal is the right thing, because there were some really significant underlying problems with normal, uh, the normal that preceded the pandemic. And let me just touch on two. One is the is the thing I referred to earlier, which is opportunity inequality. People people call this different things, and, and what, uh, what they call it sometimes is indicative of how they think it should be addressed. But um, in my mind, opportunity inequality as opposed to income inequality or wealth inequality is the most important thing. Because the thing that we're losing is the uh, fluidity across socio socioeconomic classes, where the American dream used to be that you could grow up as as a poor kid and have you know every possibility of of ending in the top quartile, and that's increasingly unlikely. The fluidity across economic strata is much less than before, and addressing that will require real uh, focus on the building blocks of opportunity in education and healthcare and things like that to give people their shot. It doesn't mean they get they get the opportunity handed to them, but they ha they, they got to have their shot. And so that's one thing that I, I hope uh, the president will be able to address and the Congress will be able to address. And it really starts with philosophically, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and then second, I think we've, um, we've really lost um, some of the underlying focus we've had historically on maintaining technology leadership. If you look at our R&D spending today is in comparison to 40 years ago, it's about half of what it was as a percentage of GDP. And I think we're gonna need to really focus on innovation, innovation policy, R&D investing, the kinds of public-private sector partnership that will lead, that led to things like the space program and so forth. Um, if we're gonna be successful as, um, you know, in leading, in leading the world uh, over, the, over the coming decades. And uh, I think that's an area where we're gonna need to make some substantive changes in policy and approach. David, I'm very intrigued by this idea that going back to normal may not be, uh, you know, so exciting and 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 perhaps a bit fanciful. Is there a time that that you can think of that was a normal we should want to return to? Well, each era, you know, each era has its <laughs> has its uh, uh, pros and cons, um, and of course, post World War II. Um, America really uh, 
you know, uh, post World War II and then post Cold War, um, we, it was a unilateral moment where America's leadership across, you know, pretty much every dimension, economically, militarily, technologically, was, you know, orders of magnitude larger than other countries around the world. That that world's changed, and so um, the things that we could take for granted uh, in the previous, you know, 30 years no longer are the case. And so, uh, as I said, there are pros and cons of every area. This this era is going to require, um, you know, sort of going back to basics, uh, as I like to say, go, going back to the gym and doing the things that we need to do as a country to make sure our building blocks of power, economic power, military power, are intact and that we're doing all we can. So our solutions um, for America's role in the world are much more in the things that we do as opposed to the things that others do. And um, I think having that focus. So uh, I, I guess if I was going to sum up in one sentence, I think China has a plan for global leadership. I think um, many countries in the world have a plan. What's our plan? What's our plan to ensure continued global leadership across all the dimensions of power? I don't think that plan's very clear, and I think that should be the focus of our policymakers in the, in the coming months and years. It's probably fair to say, David, that the economy of the 2010s was defined largely by monetary stimulus, rising asset prices, and widening inequality. Now, of course, we have a pandemic. Should the Federal Reserve be juicing markets this aggressively, or is now the time to start putting the genie back in the bottle? Well, it, it, it harkens back a little bit to my time in 2007 and 2008. It's very similar in some ways and, and different in, in, in other ways. But, but the, the bottom line is we're at a moment where we have the health crisis and the economic crisis, and we're, we're at really at the end of an era and in, in, in the midst of a paradigm shift where our ability to respond to the economic challenges we have with monetary policy alone is much more limited uh, than it has been because of the, the enormity of what's already been done. And um, and the you know the low interest rate environment we we live in, and as a consequence, we think we're going to see much more of you know MP3, which we re refer to, which is the combination of fiscal and monetary. And unfortunately, at this moment, there's going to have to be a lot of policy intervention to get us through uh, this this patch. The consequences of not um, responding in a very forceful way are are pretty dramatic. But like anything else, um, taking big steps like that in public policy have enormous second and third order questions, and we're going to, or second and third order consequences rather, and we're going to have to deal with those. And so uh, we're going to have to deal with the added indebtedness and the challenges that faces, and eventually we're going to have to begin to transition back to more normalcy in monetary policy. But I think that the time to do that is is likely much more in the future than in the, in the immediate. David, you're not one of the investors at Bridgewater. That's up to Ray Dalio and Bob Prince and Greg Jensen principally but you're a very astute observer of financial markets and a student of markets in the economy. There's a lot of talk these days about a bubble. Do you think we're in a bubble? Well, I think we're at a moment of you know, enormous uncertainty where public policy uh, is having more of an impact on markets than at, you know, certainly at any time in, in, um, in, in my adult lifetime. And so that has a number of consequences to it. And what we're seeing is really a divergence of how the real economy and the markets um, are responding to uh, what's happened. And eventually that divergence will have to be um, reconciled. But uh, in the immediate term, because of the likelihood of continued policy response, I think we're going to see market behaviors that are very, um, you know, are, 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 are very broad ranging in terms of how things play out. And the reason for that is you've got the dynamics of the pandemic and the uncertainty around that. You have the dynamics and the uncertainty around the policy response. You have the uncertainty around our political situation and polarization that we see. And you have the uncertainty globally and geopolitically with US and China. And what that means is the range of possible outcomes for investors is extremely broad. You could have everything from a Japan-style uh, recession, depression over the next uh, decade, or a 1970s stagflation. And so if you're an investor, or a policymaker, you need to be thinking about that broad continuum of possibilities. And so uh, that creates a lot of uncertainty in, in markets and a lot of uncertainty for policymakers. I will note that Japan-style recession 
or 1970s style stagflation, neither of those is a continued bull market. Well, both of them have hugely different uh, impact on different asset classes. That that that's to be sure. Uh, but but listen, you've got um, you know you've got uh, in what President Biden is proposing, uh, and um, and the and the current posture of the Fed, you have an enormous amount of policy response already done and policy response that's being contemplated, and that'll have um, you know that'll have a very very significant impacts uh, not only for markets but hopefully uh, hopefully for a real economy in addressing you know the challenge, which is that. Uh, uh, the pandemic and the economic slowdown has has really hurt the economy at, at large, but it's particularly uh, been damaging for those people who are most vulnerable, uh, for minorities, uh, for women, uh, business owners, for the people in the in the most challenged economic strata. And so we have to take a meaningful and immediate action uh, to address that economic challenge. And it also, of course, has consequences for uh, our political stability and some of the division we have in our country. So. Um, it's one of those things where there's no easy answers, and all all the responses have second and third order consequences. I, by and large, think that we're we're moving in the right direction, at least for now. David, it took a decade or so for things to properly sort themselves out in the Bridgewater C-suite. Now that you're the sole CEO, tell us where the business of the firm is headed. Does Bridgewater need a shakeup? Well, you know, if, I think if we're doing our job, we're always shaking ourselves up in the sense that we're always questioning and asking um, ourselves what we can do better. And if you look over Bridgewater's history, you know, you'll see a, 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 a path where we've, you know, had consistent success over time, but there's been dips in performance, challenges the business has, has had. And, and we're at one of those moments where uh, we sort of ask ourselves, okay, what can we do better uh, to serve our clients going forward? And 2020 was a tough year in many ways for all of us, but it was also a great year in that it forced us to, to ask ourselves, what are the things we can do better? What have, what parts of our investment machine are working? What can we do to improve on ourselves? What are we missing in markets? What does this new environment uh, suggest? And so we're in the process of doing that, and I, I, feel, I feel pretty great about it. I think the most important thing is that we serve our clients well uh, in this period and in a way that's consistent with uh, with how we operate with one another in our culture, which has been really critical to our success. And so what that means is the, the challenges I just described are what the biggest investors in the world are contemplating. How should they uh, structure their portfolios in this moment? And so we try to uh, serve their interests by having great return streams, great uh, strategies that help them achieve their goals. But more than that, we we hope to help them think more holistically about how they should be dealing with uh, with this environment. And that might mean um, how we help them structure their portfolio. It might mean helping them build out their capabilities. Um, it's certainly been highly dependent on technology. And uh, over the last uh, year, we've really accelerated serving our clients with, with our technologies to help them think about their portfolios and so forth. So uh, there's a number of things that are evolving in the way we uh, try to serve our clients and understand the markets. But if you look in Bridgewater's history, it's uh, it's a moment consistent with many moments of the past, and uh, and um, my job is to make sure we continue that evolution and and use this moment to to learn and grow as much as we can. David, you mentioned earlier that this is a time for America to think very seriously about its leadership position in the world. If people see Ray Dalio, Bridgewater's founder, as and I'm and I'm characterizing here, so let me be clear about that. People see him as sympathetic to China, and they make the assumption that that's because Bridgewater, uh, one of Bridgewater's big clients, are Chinese state interests. The way you describe it, it sounds to me, and has sounded to me in the past, like you view China through a slightly more adversarial lens. Is it is that a fair way to describe things? Uh, People are, are well, interested in understanding, you know, the firm's perspective <clears throat> on what China represents, both as client and as sort of global player. I think I'll, I'll make two comments on that. One is, um, you know, listen, understanding China uh, and and accessing China for global investors is sort of a critical question. With China being the size that it is and the impact on the economy, to be a global macro investor, you have to understand China deeply. You have to understand and, and potentially participate. If you're a global investor in 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 China's growth and so forth, so 
that's that's one bucket of questions. And um, and certainly we spend a lot of time trying to understand that and help our clients understand it. And then there's a second question, which is um, China vis-a-vis the, the, the United States. And, and the, I guess the comment I would make on that is there's a there's an evolution uh, across political parties where the relationship between China um, is evolving and China's rise and capabilities have led to an era where I think it's much more of a strategic competition than it was in the past. And uh, there's bipartisan agreement on that. And that's going to require a different approach. There's lots of ways to collaborate with China, but there will be much more competition and, and many challenges, I think, in managing that relationship going forward. David, one last one for you. Your best guess a year from now, January 2022, where will we be with COVID? Well, I'm, I'm really hopeful uh, and optimistic that the combination of the vaccines, the behavioral shifts that we're learning, companies learning to adjust, <clears throat> will, be, um, will put us in a much more um, sustainable, normal posture. Uh, with that said, I think we're also entering an area where this type of thing may be you know, more endemic. And by that, I mean, we may have to deal with variations of this uh, going forward. This is something that w- may become a more integrated part of our lives and something that we just have to uh, be able to adjust uh, to. So I, I don't think there'll be a moment in, you know, the end of the year where we say we're done with this. I think there'll be a moment where we say this is a small part of our daily conversations, but something we've had to adjust to. And, um, and we're much more back to a world that's consistent with uh, us being able to you know, be together and collaborate together and so forth, which uh, which is something I certainly miss and I suspect you do too. I do indeed, David, terrific perspective. I wanna thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on all those topics with us here at Bloomberg the year ahead. David McCormick is the CEO of Bridgewater Associates. We hope you join us for future conversations at the year ahead, David, Thanks, thank Dave. you. Nice to be with you, Thanks. No one likes to choose between safe or sporty, modern or reliable. We want both. We want a hybrid. So do banks. That's why they're going hybrid with IBM. A hybrid cloud approach helps them personalize experiences with Watson AI while helping keep data secure. From banking to manufacturing, businesses are going with a smarter hybrid cloud using the tools, platform, and expertise of IBM. Thank you very much. I am John Micklethwaite, the Editor-in-Chief at Bloomberg, and it's a delight to have Albert Buller at the Year Ahead Conference. Um, Pfizer has always been an interesting company, but I think this particular year, especially when you're looking at the issue of the year ahead, everything depends on vaccines, and quite a lot to do with vaccines uh, depends on Pfizer. It was Pfizer who were the first people with their partners, BioNTech, to get a vaccine through, to get authorization for it. Um, They're on track to create 2 billion doses this year. But as we all know, the issue of vaccines is a broad and complicated one. We're going to come to that first, and then we'll come back to discuss healthcare generally and even the other things that Pfizer does. But let's begin, um, Albert Buller, and thank you again for doing this. Um, Let's begin with the new variants. Um, The virus has mutated several times. We have variants associated with Britain and one associated with South Africa. Uh, you've said that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine works with both, but it's sort of harder with the South African one. Moderna yesterday came out with a statement saying they were going to set up a special kind of booster shot for the South African one. I suppose my basic question to you is how frightened should we be of these new variants? I think we should not be frightened, uh, but I think we need to be prepared. And uh, this is what we are doing, as I think uh, Modern also will do. So we are focusing right now to have a very good surveillance network. So every time that the new variant comes up, we should be able to test, uh, at least in the labs, if we are effective or not. This doesn't mean in the labs finding that uh, even if you have a reduction in your neutralizing titles, that you're not effective in a real life setting. But um, once we discover something that uh, it is not as effective, uh, we will uh, very, very quickly uh, produce a booster dose that uh, will be a small variation to the current one vaccine that we can do in very uh, high, uh, in, in, a, in a very speedy manner, so that we will be able to provide coverage. 
And are you already at work on that booster shot? Excuse me, can you repeat your question, John? Are you already at work on the, on the booster shot in the same way as um, Moderna is for the South African variety? Oh, yes, yes. Way back, we had discussed that, uh, the, the possibility that uh, a variant that will escape the protection uh, is, is uh, real. And uh, we were working on a process that will allow us to do the development very fast. Now already we have started uh, implementing this process. We are not working specifically on this variant right away. We are working on a process that once we discover a variant that it is uh, sensitive, we can jump immediately uh, into it. Uh, the work that it is undergoing is very intensive actually right now. Can I ask a particular thing to do with um, the speed of the doses? Yesterday, I interviewed Dr. Fauci on another World Economy Forum thing. And the main, one of the things he said very kind of strongly was he thought there was a need to get that second dose of all the vaccines quickly because he thought that made a particular difference with these new variants. Do you, do you agree with that? Because quite a lot of governments are pushing out the second dose. I agree with that absolutely. And actually, I would say that it is important to give the second dose on time in all scenarios. Now, when I say on time, I don't think that giving it a week later or two uh, is a very big uh, issue. But in general, you need to make sure that you give the second doses uh, as uh, the studies recommend that the, the vaccine works, which is in uh, three weeks. And in our study, we had actually from 19 to 42. Within this framework, I I'm fine. But uh, uh, beyond that, it's a risk. Is there some limit in that? Is that? Some governments are talking about sort of five, six, seven weeks. I mean, there's longer time, le time levels there. Does the efficacy drop off around them? Look, the, there are no data to see something like that. And we do not have data generated uh, when uh, giving the second dose apart more than, as I said, 42 days. But uh, every government, of course, has to manage a very complicated situation. And it is the health authorities of every country that has the ultimate responsibility to recommend a vaccination schedule. But from our perspective, uh, we know what data we have, and the recommendation is that uh, you should uh, give the vaccine as uh, was approved. Can I ask you about the way we should think about vaccines going forward? Is the sort of COVID vaccine going to become like the annual flu shot? Is that the way you would imagine it happening? Well, uh, I wouldn't... Uh... Exclude that. Actually, if you were asking me two months uh, earlier, I would say, well, yes, it's a possibility. If you ask me today, I think it is a high possibility. But we do not know yet. Uh, it looks like uh, that uh, COVID, the way that behaves, uh, is here to stay. But also it looks like that we have uh, the tools that uh, we will uh, make COVID like flu. Uh, means that will not disturb neither our lives, social, or the economy. It just needs to make sure that we are very vigilant about uh, the strains that exist, and we need to be very vigilant about uh, vaccinating people. Uh, if it is a need to do it every year, for example, and if this year has a renewed vaccine, like in flu, that uh, covers more of the current strains, I think that's a situation that it is... Uh, very, very um, easy to apply and uh, put an end to the pandemic and transform it to just uh, one of uh, the many diseases, seasonal diseases. Very quickly on that, do you think it would just be one shot or would it still probably be one shot that does both COVID and flu or, or do you have a, do you think it's still likely to be two? I don't think we have uh, data about it right now, but uh, if, if you ask me what is my guess based on the current existing yeah. data will be one vote. Interesting. Now, we, as you know, the big arguments at the moment on, on both sides of the, uh, the Atlantic are about supply and getting vaccines through. Now, you've said quite recently that you could get six doses from every vial that you deliver, where previously people had talked about getting five. Can you just take us through that and how that changes some of the mathematics, possibly? Yes. Yeah. Also, I want to clarify that uh, the six doses out of a vaccine of uh, out of a virus from Pfizer was never a surprise to us. We knew it uh, because we are filling the bottles. Uh, it's just that uh, when we were doing the studies, we had the five doses, and then 
when uh, we applied for the uh, emergency use authorization or full regulatory approval in Europe, we didn't have data to validate the six doses yet. So we applied with uh, all agencies, with both agencies in five. Actually, with Europe, we asked them, would you like to, have to wait a few weeks to apply for six? And they said, no, you should uh, apply now. And then when you have data for the six, you should provide to us. So once we generated the data for six, we, we, we provided not only to Europe, but to all regulatory authorities. So right now, US FDA, uh, European EMA, I believe the UK agency, the Israeli agency, the Switzerland, the WHO organization, they all have approved after they have seen the data, six doses. So that obviously is very important for the pandemic because uh, a dose that was wasted so that remained in the vial and then we were throwing it away, now it's not going to be the case. People are instructed to try to extract also the six dose and they have the means to do it as we have uh, produced. We have already supplied uh, more than 36 uh, combinations. We have validated 36 combinations of different commercially available needles and uh, syringes that can do that. That has significant uh, implications. For example, uh, in the US, we had uh, promised to provide 100 million doses by the end of the first quarter, and we will be able to provide 120 right now. Uh, the same is with the second quarter. We were planning to provide them all the way to 200 million doses by the end of the second quarter, actually beginning of the third. Right now, we will be able to provide the 200 million doses uh, two months earlier. Um, similar situation is in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we will be able to provide uh, way more in the second quarter as a result, not only of this, but of course, other measures. So it is a, a great thing for, for everyone that we, we are doing so. And actually, I think it would be criminal if uh, we can use six doses and we are throwing one uh, in, in, a, in a vaccine that can save lives right now. That's very welcome news. Just one, one particular thing on that, on, on this issue about if you need an extra dose, does that mean you also, you, you also need more kind of kit with it? Does that mean you need more syringes and all that sort of stuff? Does that become part of the equation as well? Oh, yes, you need more syringes, but eventually you need as many syringes as humans that will be vaccinated. The difference is that right now you will have the vaccine much faster for the amount of humans that you want to vaccinate than before, because now you are having 20% more doses available to you. So, of course, you will need 20% more syringes available to you. Can I ask you a particular thing on that you just mentioned the US as I understand the mathematics you, as you said you've you've contracted for 100 million which will become 120 and then you then you you've got this second 100 million but I think the total amount that the US could order their sort of option is up to 500 million are you in negotiation about that extra sort of 300 million or not so I think Talking we are all Biden. We are always discussing with all governments uh, potentials for extension of their of their uh, doses, but I have nothing to say about the U.S. particularly. And the, and the EU, I mean, particularly on that, um, as you know, this morning there's been, and the past couple of days there's been a, a real fuss, and it's not difficult to see why. I just looked this morning at our uh, virus tracker, which we have on the Bloomberg website, and that shows the EU is currently supplied about. Two, two, two doses in every for every 100 people. By contrast, Britain, although fairly lousy at dealing with COVID in many other ways, is around 10. America is quite close to that. Israel is close to 40. Um, you now have this series of uh, sort of dramas with Germany today, or German health minister speculating about the idea that there should be a ban on exports. You and others, Astra, you will, you will create vaccines in Europe, but you wouldn't be allowed to export them outside the European Union. What's, what's your reaction to that? Look, I understand how the public opinion is, uh, let's say, upset. People are afraid about the consequences of this virus. Uh, political uh, leadership is afraid. They try to do the best for their citizens. Uh, and it's a very difficult situation. So that creates a lot of tension. Uh, the voices are getting louder. And sometimes uh, uh, suggestions that they are not prudent uh, are on the table. I don't think it's a good idea even to insinuate in uh, a global supply type of uh, network that exists right now that someone can ban uh, the exports of uh, a vaccine like that. Uh, let, let's keep in mind that a lot of the raw materials that are needed to produce this vaccine are coming from other countries. So 
if one starts bans, then what will be the response of the other? And then uh, that will be a lose-lose situation rather than uh, a situation that will help Europe win. What we are doing, and we are doing very collaboratively, both with the European Commission, that we have excellent relations, and also with the state members, it is to try to increase dramatically our manufacturing capacity. And uh, right now we have announced that from 1.3 billion doses, we will be able to, that we were projecting to produce um, last year, we announced two weeks ago that right now we have a very solid plan that we will produce more than 2 billion doses this year. As a, as a result, uh, we have uh, made uh, initial agreements with the uh, uh, European Commission uh, that uh, we will provide them 200 additional, uh, 200 million additional doses to Europe, starting 75 million of them, of these 200, will be already in the second quarter. That's a promise that we gave them, and I believe that we are well on line to, to, to achieve it. Um, so I understand the concerns. I understand... Uh, uh, that everybody wants something that can potentially open the economy, save lives. And I recommend a little bit of uh, patience so that uh, we will be able to do our job and provide as much product available for everyone. What was the problem in the European Union? Um, is it, is, is, given what you've said, it sounds like the main problem is to do with governments and ordering rather than companies and supplying. Is the problem simply that they were much later to authorise the vaccine? Is that the main reason why the European Union is so far behind, at least on the numbers I've said, that, you know, America, Britain, Israel, these other places? Is that is that is that your understanding of why the, there's a sort of basic behindness there? Look, the, the, the truth is that there was a gap of two weeks be, 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 be between uh, Europeans and Americans or Israelis to, to approve the uh, the vaccine, but I think it's too early to say that Europe is uh, behind, right? So we are talking about three weeks into the vaccination program, basically. And uh, always uh, the first two weeks are a little bit challenging. If you see the performance of the US in the first weeks was really, really not good. We had many more vaccines than they could use for vaccination, but then they got their act together and now they are improving. I think it's a question of time until Europe will do so. I believe that the health authorities in most of the member states, if not in all, uh, are quite competent in Europe. This is not a third world country and uh, or continent. And uh, very soon they will rise into the occasion. It's just that uh, there is a lot of tension because there is fear out there. Uh, so let, let the voices come down and uh, everybody, let's do our jobs. We need to produce more. The physicians need to make sure that they reach the arms of the European patients and things will go well. So it's more along the lower parts of the supply chain, as far as you can see. You're, you're supplying as much vaccine as they need. The problem is on the distribution from there. No, I'm sure that pretty soon they will be able to get their act together and they will need more than we can supply. That will be the same for all the world. Everybody would like to have more than uh, we could supply. And I believe that uh, uh, when we will reach the second quarter, then this is where we'll see substantial uh, increase in our uh, ability to provide doses. And then in the third, I think uh, that will be a non-issue. But uh, when you are in the beginning, you know, this is how it works with manufacturing. We scale up production. We are installing more machines. We are uh, ordering more raw materials that manufacturers from other companies need to bring us. Uh, all of that takes time. And uh, actually, the fact that we were able to do what we are doing right now, it's really in the range of miracle. Uh, but I understand that is when people are dying, everybody will say it's not enough, do more. And this is what we are trying to do. We have a question from our audience, which is a good one and very relevant to this, is you know, how long will it take to get a, to get a Pfizer vaccine that doesn't need to be kept at such dramatically low temperatures, the sort of sub-zero temperatures that you have? Do you have a kind of target date for that? Yeah, we are working on uh, different forms that... Uh, will be much more easier to storm. One of them is, for example, a lyophilized version, which is a powder, basically, versus a liquid, and then you reconstitute the power. Uh, we are very advanced with this project, so I think we will start testing it in humans uh, uh, the first half of this year. Uh, if there is a need uh, to, to switch, I believe that uh, will happen later, either late in the second quarter, uh, late in, in this year, 
uh, or beginning of the next year. Um, however, <laughs> I have to say that uh, the ultra cold chain right now for has been proven that it's working very, very, very well. Uh, the the innovations that we have developed with this, uh, I call it magic box, but this is the box that can maintain the temperature and all the logistical uh, operation that we have with the dry eye, that we can provide dry eye and we can maintain these temperatures over there has been proven very, very effective. Um, you've had a few weeks now dealing with the, with the Biden administration. Do you notice, I mean, other than the fact that they seem more open to, to science. What, what, what's the main difference between what the, dealing with them and dealing with the Trump administration? And what would you foresee in terms of their vaccine plans? A lot of people, for instance, have said that their goal of vaccinating 100, 100 million people in the first 100 days is now all to, very easy to achieve and not really a stretch goal at all. Look, I mean, I don't want to, first of all, to take sides, uh, but uh, there is a clear difference. I believe that uh, uh, the current president is very much science-driven and oriented. Um, uh, president Trump was much more gut-feeling oriented. And uh, when it came to vaccines, because it's complicated science that he didn't uh, necessarily, uh, he couldn't, From uh, he's not a scientist, uh, gut-feeling is not the right way to go. Um, and... Uh, I believe that um, people in the previous administration did uh, their best to, to, to organize an operation that uh, will help uh, the American people. Um, I mean, the indications is that uh, the new people understand better what they are doing. And the 100, the 100 million doses in 100 days, does that look all too easy to you on the basis of the numbers you've just talked about earlier? Well, in terms of us providing um, uh, enough doses to be able to do it, yes, we will. Uh, but, uh, of course, there are many other uh, issues involved logistically. Uh, so the doses that they are in our manufacturing sites in, in uh, Europe or in the U.S. reach the arms of people that need to be vaccinated, and that's up to the, to the healthcare authorities to accomplish. I'm going to come quickly to the developing world in a second, but there's another qu question from the audience, which is this, this issue of all the people, and it's particularly, I think, as some evidence, particularly prone in, in minorities in the United States, this issue about fears of taking the vaccine. What, what are you doing to combat those? Or do you think that's a job for government? No, I think it's a job for everyone. It's a job for you as journalists. It's a job for the government. It's a job of every scientist yeah. that can, we can speak out, and it is a job of us. What I would say it is that those that uh, they have fears, okay, I understand them, uh, and uh, but they need to think that when it comes to vaccines, uh, the decision to take it or not will not uh, affect only their own lives. Uh, they will affect the lives of others, and likely, uh, or most likely, it will affect the lives of people that they love the most, which are the people that they socialize the most. If you don't take the vaccine, you're becoming the weakling that allows this virus to replicate. So please think it twice before you make such a decision. And, uh, you know, uh, don't let uh, fear uh, get in the way. Uh, right now, I think, as uh, someone else has said before me, that uh, fear is the only thing that we should fear right now. On, on you just talked about that that issue about the spreadability. I mean, there is there is also, of course, a developing world out there. I know you've been part of the uh, WHO's COVAX scheme to get vaccines out to the to the poorer countries of the world. You just I think committed 40 million doses to that. But by any measure, that's much smaller than going to the developed world. Are you worried at all by the idea that the firstly the rich world does get fairly vaccinated, but then the poorer world doesn't? And not only is that possibly morally bad, but it also provides a kind of breeding ground for new variants of the of the virus. Is that is that a fair way to look at the next couple of years? I, I would say so. I think in pandemics you are as protected as your neighbor, and uh, it is extremely important that we will not let what you said before happen, which is that uh, the rich countries will get vaccinated and the poor will not. Not only because that will be a threat also to the rich countries. That's not the point. The point is that there is a human decency here and there is a need for everyone 
to have equitable access to vaccines. Right now, I think uh, both uh, WHO and UNICEF, uh, they are doing a really uh, tremendous effort to be able to resolve logistical issues, infrastructure issues, legal issues that will allow uh, everyone to have access to these vaccines. And the contract that uh, uh, we signed with uh, WHO and the COVAX facility, basically, and we are about to, to complete with a supply agreement with, uh, with UNICEF, it's a great start. Uh, and uh, I think uh, more uh, will continue after we exhaust those uh, first uh, doses. And also, uh, I need to say that in uh, the low-income countries, which are the countries that these doses will go, Pfizer will provide this vaccine at a non-for-profit uh, basis. Uh, so I, I hope that things will improve uh, dramatically. There's, there is an interesting and, and very difficult question. It'd be a difficult question for anyone. But it's how, how do you prioritise these things? As you say, you've got the you've got various contracts with rich countries. By any measures, fewer are going to to the the poorer world. How do you, you know personally? How do you try to prioritise which bits? I mean, do you, is it business? Is it logic? What, what what what? How do you how do you look at that problem? Yeah, in an equitable basis. Let me explain that. Back in May June we reached to basically every single government in the world. And uh, everyone knew where to find us if we didn't do it proactively to them. But we did reach proactively. And uh, we asked them that uh, they should place order and uh, so that we know how to allocate those doses. And uh, as they started placing orders, we, we came coming back and, you know, we were asking them, Please, can you provide more? For example, in the US, the original contract was only 100 million doses. I personally asked them multiple times, wouldn't you like to make a, a greater order? They said no. So we committed these doses to others. Then they came and they wanted another 100 million doses. And that was quite challenging to find it. But eventually, we were able, by increasing production, to find it. And uh, the same is with, with multiple um, other countries. So those that they placed orders, uh, they are the ones. Those are all, that they are it, those, are, those are all at the same. With the rich world, they're all at the same price of like twenty dollars or whatever. Um, it's but these put the poorer countries. You are giving them at cost. Correct. Can I ask you a, a kind of thing to step back? I mean, you've been in the middle of this. You've seen a lot of it. When you look at healthcare systems around the world and the future of healthcare, what? What would you do? I mean, just to start, give, give a precise example. If you were in Joe Biden's shoes and you were trying to do something about the U.S. healthcare system, you know, by any measure, America has had a, a rotten time with COVID. I just checked this morning. It's over 1,300 deaths for every million people. You go to Asia and there are many countries there which are fewer than 50. China claims a number of fewer than three. So by any measure, America has had a rotten time. Um, and although it's traditional to blame drug companies in this, you know, the main thing seems to be a healthcare system that, that isn't good at dealing with pandemics. But, you know, what would you do out of interest? So, so what's the one I, thing you would like to do to change the readiness of, of, of America, just to use that as a first example? I believe that a lot contributed to this uh, uh, very absolutely devastated number in, in the United States. And actually, politicization of the COVID uh, was one of them. Uh, it became a political statement not to wear a mask, for example. I think uh, that was quite unique in this country, uh, and uh, that uh, contributed significantly to the increased uh, number of, of deaths. Uh, but uh, going back, uh, let's say, leave behind the, the, the COVID. Uh, what I would say, if, if I was Joe Biden, I'm not, and uh, is uh, he needs to, to, to take his decisions. But I believe uh, one of the uh, big lessons that uh, COVID uh, taught us uh, is the power of science in the hands of the private sector. Uh, it was uh, the private sector, it was uh, the healthcare industry that uh, resolved the issue of ventilators in the beginning, and it was the healthcare industry that brought the diagnostics in record time when they were needed, and then later the treatments, and then now the vaccines. And uh, those things didn't happen by chance. They happened because uh, we had uh, a vibrant industry. It happened because we had billions of investments and an infrastructure that uh, had gathered the 
most brilliant scientist in the world, uh, sitting and working together for years to try to tackle the, the best, uh, the, the most devastating diseases, cancer, Alzheimer's, I can go on and on. So, do you think, the, do you think this, but do you think this is a chance to change the reputation of the, of the, you know, the complaints about big pharma? At this precise moment, many of the people who used to complain about big pharma are waiting desperately for vaccines you produced. Are there other diseases that that you can take things like your new mRNA? Um, technology and apply it to. We've got questions coming in about whether we do vaccines for diseases like TB. We've got the issue about whether we could have the same kind of attention devoted to, to diseases like cancer. Um, is this a chance for the kind of pharmaceutical industry to change the dynamic of things? And how promising is this new technology? No, I, I think uh, we, we are having a good opportunity to change and improve our reputation. I wouldn't declare victory. I think what happened with COVID was catalyst. I think that moved significant the needle, but the reputation uh, is earned in a drop. You can lose it uh, in buckets. So we need to continue earn our right to be considered a pivotal part of the society, a pivotal uh, value contributor to, to the society. And uh, we should not declare by any means victory. I do believe that we are living a scientific renaissance. RNA is just one example of the things, the mRNA technology, I mean, of the things that can happen. It's the only one. Clearly, I think mRNA had a very profound demonstration of its power, and I believe that uh, this technology will be used. We are working on that anyway in uh, other vaccines like flu, like other uh, infectious diseases, but also in other applications, uh, cancer, etc. cetera. Um, but that's the, not the only one. And uh, going back to what I would say that uh, the policies that uh, the, the political uh, leadership should be pursuing, I think they should be pro-innovation and pro-patient policies. Pro-innovation means that these policies should provide incentives, should encourage the innovation and should encourage the maintenance of a very vibrant uh, uh, private sector in this healthcare. And then the second, the pro-patient policies, needs to be policies that will allow easy access to all of these medicines. One very last question, just on the idea of a world sort of vaccination program, something perhaps attached to the UN or maybe to the WHO, that there should be a kind of Manhattan project to come up with vaccines for the future, where all the countries should collaborate. Is that realistic? I think that uh, the way that the things are working uh, it's not let's sit all together and work. <laughs> you need to have ready teams that uh, they should uh, know each other, they should have the infrastructure, in some cases compete, because that's also very healthy when it comes to compete to bring life to people who will be best and first, and collaboration. During the COVID-19, there was significant collaboration between companies, and there was significant collaboration between regulatory agencies, and the academia and the uh, private sector. But uh, it was the, the vibrancy of the industry <laughs> that brought it. So we should be focusing on seeing what went right now and build on it, what went wrong, and take it out. That's a very good note to end on. Albert Bola, CEO of Pfizer, thank you very much for coming to the year ahead at Bloomberg. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor, sir. Good morning and welcome. I am David Dwyer, Global Director of Research for Bloomberg Intelligence. Bloomberg Intelligence is Bloomberg's investment research uh, department. Bloomberg Intelligence covers uh, more than 130 industries, 2,000 companies, and dozens of markets across equities, fixed income, currencies, commodities, and many other areas. Every year, we partner with Bloomberg Business Week to come up with a 50 companies to watch for the year ahead. And we're very excited to introduce that uh, this year. I think one of the points that I would make is 2020 was obviously a tumultuous year. And I think one of the things that everybody noticed is that when the markets started to recover um, in, in uh, post the early stages of COVID, is that it was driven by large cap growth companies. Well, we think the opportunity is going to be a little different in 2021. 
In a couple of days, you're going to be hearing from Gina Martin Adams, our global equity strategist. And she's been talking for a couple months now that the opportunities are going to shift towards a catch up in companies that are more value oriented and smaller cap. And that's where we're hoping to catch some of those opportunities in our 50 companies to watch. With that in mind, I want to uh, point out the 50 companies to watch are really broken down by a number of different themes. And, and those themes start, the largest of which, not surprisingly, is a post-COVID recovery and, and what, that's going to, what companies are really going to benefit from the post-COVID recovery. But interestingly, uh, most of the other th themes have some relation to a post-COVID recovery. Uh, a green recovery uh, is also important to us. Uh, new products, oftentimes those new products are new products that are going to become more important in a post-COVID world. Digital transformation, in many cases, have been accelerated because of, of COVID. Uh, and of course, there's always uh, situations of, of, uh, of corporate actions, such as management changes, IPOs, divestitures, and so on. Uh, and then the, finally, the last three are areas where where has e-commerce really accelerated and, and changed into another stage post-COVID or smart healthcare, obviously, or fintech or digital payments. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about five companies that we think really represent uh, a, a good cases of our 50 companies to watch. And I will point out that these companies are across different parts of the world. And I hope that many of these companies you've never heard of, because we're really trying to identify um, companies that, that maybe are not widely recognized uh, versus so, so many companies that get a lot of attention. So let's start with the green recovery. A uh, company that we, are, that we are really interested in is Albemarle. Uh, Albemarle is a, a U.S. company. It's the leader and uh, leading supplier of global lithium, which um, you, know, you may be aware is a key ingredient in batteries. Uh, Albemarle controls about 30 percent of the global lithium market, which is about $3 billion. And our analyst uh, believes that the market for lithium will probably triple over the next five years. And Albemarle is in particularly good position to capitalize on that, particularly even in the next year, because it can expand its capacity rapidly uh, with, uh, with, with expansions in both Chile and Australia and even additional resources in the U.S. He also thinks prices for lithium uh, will start to rise as demand recovers uh, or demand increases in both Europe and in China uh, for electric vehicles, and that demand will drive prices higher. Some of the early stages of pricing he thinks you're seeing um, in China in the fourth quarter. Moving on to fintech and digital payments, we go down to Africa and Kenya specifically and talk about Safaricom, the leading cell phone carrier in Kenya. Um, and what's interesting about this company is it's an innovator in virtual banking. About a third of its revenue uh, come from uh, digital banking, and it's much faster. Uh, it's a much faster growth business than its cell phone business. Uh, what's interesting during COVID is they expanded the the limit for fee free uh, transactions uh, to uh, uh, significantly, and that created a lot of awareness and the ability for customers to use their phones for digital transfers. Uh, the value of transaction growth has increased. Uh, from what it used to be 8% uh, to now more than 30% as the awareness has increased. The company generates 5% free cash flow, a strong 4% dividend yield, and it has an opportunity to expand into Ethiopia in 2021. Moving back to the U.S., uh, we talk about Teladoc in the smart healthcare area. And as we all know, smart healthcare has really been expanding in importance uh, given COVID. And uh, Teladoc is really a leader in this business. And while it's a $2 billion business projected for 2021, our analyst feels that uh, the total market is going to be closer to $250 billion in opportunity over the years. So a huge, huge opportunity to grow. Uh, he also believes that that uh, COVID jump-started the virtual health, health business, business by five years. And you can see that for Teladoc. Teladoc uh, had uh, something in the neighborhood of 14 million 
uh, virtual visits in 2020. That's more than double what it was in 2019. So you can see how it's really jump-started the opportunities for that business. They've also started to go through and have a transformational acquisition in chronic care capabilities, such as hypertension and diabetes, which in and of itself is a $45 billion market. Moving back uh, to another area, Europe, and uh, a company called Wizz Air, uh, we're always, I think everybody's looking at, you know, what's going to happen to the airline industry and which airlines will recover well in this business. Well, our analyst thinks Wizz Air is one to really point out. Uh, it's an Eastern European upstart. It Prior to COVID, it was the fastest growing airline in Europe, very well positioned, low cost pr provider of air, air care, uh, low cost pr provider of air services. Uh, the um, point I think we our analysts would make is it has enough liquidity to survive the crisis. Uh, it's so well capitalized that it could cover all of its fixed costs through early 2023, even without any of its planes flying. It's really very impressive. Uh, its low cost profile and no unions compared to its peers really put it in a position that it's been able to expand uh, market share in Europe. Uh, and in, most importantly, it's heavily exposed to faster growing economies in Eastern Europe, such as Hungary, Poland, and Romania. And finally, I'm going to go back and talk about digital transformation. And we're going to go back to Africa, in this case, South Africa, and one of its most important banks, uh, Capitec. In this particular case, this is a bank that really is uh, a great example of a company that's benefited and grown significantly over the past number of years through digital transformation. It's custom built a branch network that's built on top of uh, a strong technological in advance. It's strong technological innovation. Uh, it's got advantages over its competitors because it's got about a 40% cost to income ratio compared to its peers at 60%. And you know this this high efficiency. Uh, leads to return on equities of 25 to 30 percent high growth rates versus return on equities of 15 percent for, for its peers. Yeah, it's fully integrated uh, technological platform is something called Global One. And what it does is it really enables all of its customers to see all of their products in one digital place. Uh, also allows for, for their customers to be cross-sold those products. And not only is this a company that's been focused on the, the mainstream consumer banking business, but it's a company that will be able to expand in, uh, this digital platform into all sorts of other areas, including higher net worth uh, customers, small business banking, and, uh, and, in, and even insurance. So with that... Uh, thank you very much, and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions uh, on any of the companies that we've presented in our, in our Bloomberg Business Week, uh, 50 Companies to Watch. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Miller. I'm the global editor of Bloomberg Live, and today it's my pleasure to welcome Sharmishta Dubey, the CEO of Match Group, to the year ahead. Hello, Shar. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're talking about the future of online dating and love in the time of the coronavirus. Or as I like to think uh, about this conversation, let's find Mark Miller a husband. Uh, I, I'm sorry about that, Char. I'll try not to make this all about me. Um, let me give our, our viewers a brief overview of Match Group. Uh, Match Group owns eight um, of the world's biggest dating apps which uh, are Tinder, Hinge, OkCupid, Match, uh, Plenty of Fish, Our Time, and uh, several others. You're by far the biggest player in the online dating business with, uh, I believe, an average of 10.8 million subscribers worldwide. Uh, in 2019, you had revenue of more than $2 billion. And since March, and I think this will give our viewers a sense of uh, what online dating is like um, in a pandemic, matches stock prices nearly tripled, and you joined the NASDAQ 100 in December. Um, so, Char, early 2020 must have been a surreal time for you. You officially took over as CEO in March, just as the pandemic was shutting down New York, Europe, Asia, other parts of the world. What was your first reaction when you heard about this? 
You know, um, we don't have a business in China, but we do have businesses in Japan and uh, Korea and other parts of Asia. And so back in late January, Feb, we were tracking uh, what was happening in those uh, countries and we were watching to see if it was impacting any of our metrics. And we hadn't really seen much of an effect uh, at the time. Um, there was, however, I, I, I do remember this um, clear uh, early March um, sort of realization walking down New York City is, oh, Wuhan is shutting down. Like, surely there is no way New York City shuts down. And so there was a part of this, of everything that happened I could not have seen. But we were, uh, at the back of my mind, I think I did have this idea that what if it does? And what if we're all kind of stuck at home? Do we even have all the bandwidth? Do, do all of our employees have um, laptops that they can work for remotely? And so we had done a little bit of prep, perhaps three to four weeks ahead of that mid-March um, fateful time when the news started coming from uh, Spain and Italy and then quickly came to New York and uh, California. And um, Yes, those were a couple of weeks that I don't think uh, any of us could have uh, imagined what life was going to become. Was there ever any moment when you thought, you know, what if this is the end of dating, you know, as we know it? Did you did you have that kind of uh, dark thought or did you just think, OK, uh, we're going to figure out how to move forward? You know, I uh, I have fundamentally always known that this is such an essential thing for humans. It's existential. Finding love and relationships and connections is existential. So I don't think I ever for a moment um, thought about this being the end of dating. I certainly worried about what the short-term volatility might be because at the end of the day, dating requires a certain um, you know frame of mind and uh, a certain outlook and the anxiety and the shock and sort of the, the news that was uh, going around. Uh, it was certainly going to have a, an impact to how users behave, that much I knew. Uh, but I, uh, not for a second, I thought this is going to be uh, and the end of people's quest for love. It never is. Uh, you know, speaking personally, and again, we're trying not to make this all about me. But you know, I, you're right. In that, in that first period, I wasn't going on the the apps, the, the dating apps. You know, I'm on. Uh, tender and hinge myself, and I wasn't in the right frame of mind to do that. Um, and it looks like other people weren't either in that first quarter. But then by, you know, the summer, late spring, summer, fall, you know, uh, people were certainly in my circles were back on. Um, and that and that seems to be reflected in your data as well, right? That's exactly what we saw in terms of activity. The first couple of weeks when the news was just, um, you know, so shocking around the world, we saw a negative impact to um, all of our activity and uh, KPIs across all platforms. Um, but, you know, by the time April came around, things started um, taking back up. And by summer, uh, it was a whole different, uh, different world. I believe starting then, around April, you began rolling out uh, different products uh, on the apps to, to make it easier for people to connect virtually. So one-on-one -on -one live capability, I believe you began rolling out in April across your portfolio. Um, how did you decide to do that and, um, and, and what's the effect been? Yes, so um, we started pivoting our product and our marketing right out the gate um, once the lockdowns came about. We knew uh, we had a lot of people calling us about what this all meant, and um, so some of the early pivots were about getting uh, people comfortable, giving them more information. We uh, launched hotlines. Uh, we saw this uh, interesting trend where suddenly people were um, not just looking for people in their own area, which is normally what happens on dating apps, but they were reaching out to Italy, 
like people in the U.S. were reaching out to Italy and Spain, and we um, have a few features that allow people to do that uh, that you've got to pay for. We made it all free and available, for instance. And then the big one, which is, okay, if people are going to be um, less willing and able to go meet in uh, the real world, what does that mean? Video obviously became such a big part of all our everyday lives at work and in every other way, it made all the sense in the world for it to be part of the uh, platforms. And so in addition to rolling out live video on our platforms, we also started giving, um, uh, providing users uh, you know, things to do. How do you do a good video date? Is it okay to cook together? Or, you know, what are sort of the icebreakers that you do? And so a lot of our product evolution during those um, few months were in that, in that zone. And we've seen a real adoption of video, which shouldn't come as a surprise just by virtue of how we've all evolved. But by summer, about half of our users were already telling us they had been on a video date. And uh, that was a big, big transformation, I think, for our category and our platforms. I think your users have also indicated that they intend to continue using video, um, you know, as a potential first date, uh, as a way to check chemistry, even when we have emerged from the pandemic. Um, is that is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, I have been such a big believer in the power of video to sort of bridge the disconnect that happens between the chat messaging and then the first time you actually meet someone in person. And so I have been experimenting with uh, live video for almost 10 years, long before the technology was great. Uh, and the adoption has had not been all that great. But in I've always believed this is such a great medium to have a half date so that the quality of your first date is so much better. And so um, I think finally it took the lockdown to get people to use it. And once they've used it, uh, the feedback we've gotten is once people use it, they love it. They see, you know, it, it's a great safety tool for a lot of people as well. And it's a great way of knowing if, you know, you're going to have chemistry and actually have a real good first date when you uh, meet in person. So uh, I do think uh, even if the degree of usage comes down a little bit, I do think people have gotten comfortable to a point where, where they see the value of this medium going forward. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense to me. There's sort of no way to go back, even, or or you know, a reason to go back to not using video, even in events like the ones that we do at, at Bloomberg. Um, as I mentioned before, you're a global company, um, and your products outside the U.S. are growing uh, rather quickly. And two important markets for Match Group that it might surprise people, or at least they surprise me, are Japan and India. Um, what apps are popular there, and why do you think online dating is growing quickly in those markets, for example? So uh, a big part of, um, if you think about the history of uh, our category, um, obviously Match.com started the category about 20 plus years ago in the U.S., and then uh, it grew in popularity in the U.S. and Western Europe. Uh, and so we have a brand called Meetic in Western Europe, and they paved the way for uh, the dating apps uh, in the Western world. But much of the um, much of Asia and rest of the world um, has been behind, both in terms of um, uh, uh, connectivity with um, smartphones and uh, acceptance of uh, dating apps as a way to uh, meet people. But that's growing. These are parts of the world where the population is growing. Young people are uh, taking over the choice of uh, partners, particularly in India. That's a big cultural, social cultural shift that's happening, uh, moving away from arranged marriages and young people becoming em more empowered to make this important choice uh, uh, on their own. Um, and, and that is sort of the driving force behind uh, the growing uh, 
popularity of our apps in those markets. So Japan, as you said, has been one of our largest uh, and fastest growing markets. Um, we have a local product called Pairs in that market, which is the number one uh, dating app in Japan. But Tinder is also really popular in Japan. Um, and Tinder is one of those unique platforms that's popular around the world in over 100 uh, countries. It's popular in India, but we've also introduced OkCupid in there, uh, and that's uh, growing in popularity in India. And so um, that's, I think, uh, a part of the world where we will continue to see a lot of fun and uh, activity happening. So um, as you think about the long-term effects of the pandemic on online dating, um, and since this is the, the year ahead event, how do you see the year ahead for um, your company, um, both in terms of your own workers? I assume your workers or your employees are working remotely for the most part at this at this time. Do you, you know, is that a long term, um, you know, um, consequence of this pandemic? Do you think you'll have more of your own employees working from home going forward? Um, and and what does it mean for the business ahead for you? Yeah, uh, we actually have most of our employees, particularly in the U.S., uh, working from remotely still, uh, although we have opened a few of our offices for, um, you know, to give people a choice if they don't have a, a, a good work environment to come to. I do expect... Um, once this is all over, which I'm, uh, I remain optimistic, is months uh, from here, that uh, it will be a, a, some sort of a hybrid. We have certainly gotten used to the flexibility that uh, working from home and remote working has provided. There are real productivity gains for not having to sit on uh, in a car for 45 minutes to an hour every day. And, uh, and those are benefits I think we should take advantage of. At the same time, uh, I think people are realizing more and more about the value of that serendipitous running into someone in the corridors and having the conversation and the energy and the innovation and the um, uh, and the conversation that that leads to, which is going to be important. Uh, and so I do expect us to get into some sort of a hybrid, uh, more flexible, but definitely not a full on uh, remote working situation. Uh, in terms of the business itself, Look, uh, we're still in the, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, believe it or not, in uh, lots of uh, of the part of the world. So I do expect uh, short term volatility uh, based on uh, different markets. But um, I, you know, as I said, I think um, finding love and uh, the relationship and meaningful connections is uh, that much more important when we are dealing with um difficult situations. And so ultimately, I think our products have a real uh, strong value proposition and a role to play. And uh, we will eventually uh, come out uh, better and stronger on the other side of this. It is a, you know, a crowded um, marketplace. I mean, you own many of the uh, of the apps, obviously, but Bumble is out there. They're one rival. They've announced that they will IPO. Uh, this spring, uh, or I, perhaps in February, a m potentially much bigger player in the space has, has entered the market, Facebook. Um, how do you see your competition, um, not just with them, but potential other players? Um, you know, you're an engineer by training. Uh, you must always, and now you're CEO, you must always be thinking about, okay, who's who's coming to disrupt, you know, my business, like we disrupted the dating business many years ago, uh, traditional dating. How do you see that competition? Yeah, so I, I actually like the, uh, to think about my tenure, and I've been here 15 years. When I started, 3% of marriages in the U.S. started online, and today that number is over 40%. So in some ways, as leaders of uh, of this category, who started this category, disrupted it again with Tinder, um, we owe it to ourselves to always be on the cutting edge of innovation uh, to make sure um, you know, we're growing and expanding this category worldwide. In terms of 
competition, you know, I've always thought of competition exactly how you said. Every every other way that people meet is a potential competition for us. Friends and family, um, church, school, work, uh, restaurants, bars, um, other online uh, uh, players, as you um, uh, mentioned, are always a competition that we're watching. Um, and, you know, Facebook came into the category almost three years ago, believe it or not, in different markets. And we've, of course, been watching closely and we've said this publicly. We haven't really seen um, an impact to our business. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's something that we are maniacally focused on, what everybody else is doing, but we always uh, are looking to make sure we are at the cutting edge of technology and disrupting ourselves and being ahead of the game. Uh, before we wrap up here, I did want to talk about a couple of important um, issues, obviously, in the news lately. We saw um, January 6th, the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Um, I have noticed that you and other dating app companies are cooperating with law enforcement and in providing information uh, about those who participated in the in insurrection. Walk me through that thinking and why, why that is the case. Why are you working with them? Yeah, um, you know, about January 6th, um, it hit a lot of us personally. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I, I chose to come to this country 25 years ago because of everything that America stands for, uh, opportunities, freedom, democratic institutions, values, principles. So it was personally a very... Um, a, a very difficult day uh, to watch. But... Uh, that this 25 years of my incredible experience in this country is what makes me an optimist. And so I do think we will um, find the empathy and the respect and um, open mindedness to get back on on track. And this will be a blip in our history. Um, so that's just me, you know, on the personal side. Um, in, in terms of um, our engagement with law enforcement, we've always leaned in favor of safety. And we've always had a policy of not allowing uh, hatred and violence on our platforms. And uh, that has not changed. It, it remains uh, true um, to this day. And we will always work with law enforcement and cooperate with them uh, to make our platforms more safe. And so it was not a departure of any kind uh, for us. And obviously, in the past year, we've had this um, tremendous reckoning around race um, and inequality, um, and that's a, a conversation that will uh, continue, obviously, on. Um, there has been some discussion about whether dating apps should continue to allow race filters, for example, for users to to filter their um, potential dates uh, by race as one of the factors. MASH Group is continuing to, uh, to allow that, which is uh, some people have criticized. What, what was, uh, what's behind your decision making on continuing that filter? Um, as you can imagine, it's, it's been a big topic of conversation for us all year, all, all of last year for sure. Um, there's a couple of things here. One, um, at, at macro level, I do think uh, dating apps have been really great in um, actually allowing and breaking down some of these barriers because in Otherwise, you don't have the ability to branch out of your uh, sort of uh, degree, few degrees of separation in order to find potential partners. And that causes more and more of this sort of tribalism, if you will. Um, in fact, there's a very interesting um, uh, data out of Pew, which shows the growth of interracial marriages in the U.S. And e um, even though it's still around 16, 17 percent, uh, you see a clear uh, change in trajectory and scope as dating apps become popular. And it's for that same reason for people who 
don't think this is a problem. It gives them more avenues to find people um, of different races. However, the, one of the things we did uh, find is the use of the filters on the platforms that we have is actually used more and more frequently by minority groups, which sort of makes sense because um, you know, to the extent people look at this as a way of um, uh, relating to their cultural identities and upbringing and values, um, it is harder to find if you don't have this filter for these smaller groups um, on, on our platform, on our large ma mass market platforms. And that has been the thinking for allowing it to continue. But we keep talking to our uh, customers and users and we uh, evaluate this all the time. So that, that's sort of where we are. I would love to continue to talk to you about uh, these issues. I think it's really fascinating because I think you're right. Um, the search for human connection is is something that um, is intrinsic to who we are. Uh, but we do have to wrap up. Uh, but I really appreciate you spending this time with us, Shar, and good luck in the year ahead. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us for the first session on this, the first day of the year ahead. I hope you enjoyed these conversations. Thank you again to all our wonderful speakers for this amazing program. And thank you to our sponsors, Alex Partners and IBM. And most of all, thank you for being such an engaged audience. To rewatch any part of this event, you can come back to this website where the recordings will be uploaded. And you can also access all of our videos on Bloomberg Live's page on YouTube. The year ahead continues this afternoon at 12 noon Eastern time and on January 27th and 28th. You can check out our agenda at BloombergLive.com and make a note of the sessions you simply can't miss. We do hope you'll join us again. And thank you for being with us today.